Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. On today's episode, I want to welcome my friend, Carl Barkley. Carl's a founder of D3 Direct, and D3 Direct exists to share the stories of NCAA Division III student-athletes and explore their journey from recruit to the real world. D3 Direct is the go-to source for information and advice on D3 recruiting, admissions, and more. Carl speaks directly to D3 student athletes and coaches to learn about their college experiences and share those takeaways through the D3 Direct platform. Carl played his collegiate basketball at Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania, where he was a team captain for two years. This episode was so great, folks. We learn everything D3, both about the talent level uh, among D3 players. Yes, they can go play pro. And he gives us some examples of uh, overseas players and D3 players who've made it to the um, NBA. We also talk about a lot of the money issues. Like, are there scholarships? No. But can you go to D3 schools for free? Yes. We get into all that, financial aid, and um, much, much more, including where to start this process, how to find schools, what to weigh, and what schools in the D3 world, uh, what their admission departments are looking for, and how you can get more money. So that's what's coming up on this episode today. Also, if you like this uh, podcast, go ahead and subscribe at all the major platforms uh, for podcasts as well as YouTube. And go to my website, prepathletics.com, to make sure you sign up for the newsletter. Here's the show. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm. I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe. Maybe so you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh yeah, somebody wants me. Carl, welcome to the show today. Thanks for having me, Corey. Hey, we've been chatting on and off for months now, and I'm so excited to have you on this show because you created um, an entity called D3 Direct. Um, why don't you tell me a little bit about that and, and why you started it? Sure. So it's, uh, I guess it started out as a, an opportunity just to you know, catalog my division three recruiting experiences and college experiences as a way to reflect. And then um, thought about it as a, as a way to give back a lot of information to people who are just starting that search. And um, so, yeah, it's just, it's grown from there. It's, it's, um, I've tried to stack my, my experience with uh, the experience of a lot of other division three student athletes together and, and build something that, um, you know, I, I feel like anyone coming from any background can can feel like they can use in their college uh, recruiting and admissions process. Do you wish in hindsight there would have been a D3 direct for you to use as a resource when you were going through this as a player? Yeah, I think so. And I think I think that's the gap we're trying to fill, I, you know, both for for student athletes already in college and then those trying to play in college. Um, yeah, just be the person that I wish I'd had in my recruiting journey who I could have turned to and said, Hey, you know, what do I do here? Or, or do you know someone to talk to about this? Or, you know, how do I write this essay? And um, so, yeah, I think just having that person that I could have turned to and, and uh, leaned on for some advice. Yeah. We'll get to high school players in a little bit on how you help them, but explain to me a little bit about what you just said about you help current D3 student athletes. What do you do in that regard? Yeah, I think in that regard, it's, it's trying to show people, already in college that there are a lot more opportunities out there other than what they would assume is a traditional, uh, you know, outcome from college. And that could be anything from going to play pro. We try to highlight all of the division three, um, you know, basketball, but also other sports that are going to play, um, you know, whether it's in England, getting a master's degree and, and uh, continuing to play your sport, or we've, we've profiled people playing down in, Puerto Rico, Japan, um, Spain, all over Europe. And um, so I think, yeah, trying to show people that those opportunities exist. And then also just generally networking and, and uh, trying to demonstrate the power that division three alumni networks have um, for your job prospects after graduation. So I've been working with a couple people on things like that. And um, yeah, I think, I think those are probably the main two. Gotcha. Now for this conversation, we're going to strictly talk about basketball okay I know you do with other sports but that's the one right. everyone's tuning in to hear about so why don't you tell me Carl what's the biggest misconception that you've seen about division three basketball 
Yeah, I feel like, I mean, there are a lot. Uh, we try to address them on the page because they, you know, we, we operate mostly in Twitter and, and they're, you know, it's a breeding ground for misconceptions to flourish about, about the level of play. And, um, you know, I think one is that, that people going to play division three aren't recruited athletes. And I think that's totally bogus. And, um, you know, the commitment that they're signing up for is, is not quite on the level of division one. I think what makes division three a great opportunity and, and in my opinion, the best opportunity available to high school athletes is the balance that you do get between your time and um, that in which you're giving to your, to your sport, but it's still a massive commitment. And these people are, uh, you know, incredibly hard workers. They're smart. They have grades uh, and they really have to earn their way into these schools that they're getting into, which oftentimes are some of the best academic schools in the country, you know, on top of um, being great athletic opportunities as well. Yeah. Isn't one of the knocks on D3 basketball that coaches don't get enough time with them like is there some i vaguely know about this isn't there some rule like a coach can't meet with his team until sometime in october november mm -hmm. yeah i think the current setup is two weeks later than uh than division one and division two which is you know in some ways i guess as a player you're on campus and we're you're working out anyways you got uh, captain led drills. You got things that, that the coach is able to talk to the captain and give them instructions. And, but the coach just cannot be there in person. And so I feel like, you know, there probably is a happy medium, maybe bump it up a week if it's two weeks right now. And I, I think that's more less anything about the difference in the, in the <coughs> level of play and more just outdated rules that, that the NCAA should probably update. Yeah. That seems like one that, I don't know why, what the, re do you know the logic on why it was that way? Was it academic I, focused? I want to say, yeah, probably D3 wanting to have a different little bit of a differentiation between um, time and, and a hard stop for athletes to get settled into school academically. But, um, you know, the great thing about D3 athletes is they do get it done in the classroom, regardless mm -hmm. of time pressure and, um, so I think an extra week would help because I always remember going into those first couple games of the year and never feeling fully, you know, settled in, fully prepared. It was always a little rushed. We were putting in offenses. We were trying to scout and it's just a lot to do in, in not a lot of time. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That would be a challenge right there. Um, your, your, your Twitter page is, is, is great great information on a daily basis so anyone that um you know wants to learn more about this absolutely follow carl in d3 direct and one of the things i've found on one of your more recent tweets is some of the myths about d3 mm -hmm. and i want to go through these and i think we can expound on, on each one uh number one you said d3 student athletes don't go pro and you just mentioned earlier uh some examples of kids that are going pro and there are a few examples of D3 guys actually going to the NBA. Um, yep. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the pro options, both NBA for the few guys that did that and for overseas? Sure. Yeah, I think, I think you know, as I alluded to earlier, the, there are a lot of pro opportunities. And I think it's only the, the number of opportunities for Division three players is only growing as they become more, more you know, popularly known. Um, in, in D3 circles. And there are a lot of great agencies that, that represent a ton of D3 players and are willing to give kind of who understand the differences. You know, I've spoken to some people in England who said that there are different allocations provided for D1 versus other divisions in the United States. And, that, and it comes from you know, maybe a lack of understanding of where the breakdown is, but also, you know, some preference deservedly so is given to D1 players. Um, but yeah, then, then you just look all, all around the world. And as I mentioned, a couple countries, you know, tons of places in, in Europe, uh, the whole team that played in the, T, the TBT tournament, We Are D3, is, you know, top to bottom filled with, with pro players. And, you know, I think as, it'll only grow as more and more guys retire from the game and become resources who then give back to younger guys in their circles and become sources of advice for them and can say, Hey, you know, here's how I put together a highlight tape and 
you know, here are the steps I took to find an agent and, you know, here are the mistakes you can avoid that I kind of, that tripped me up early on as a, as a pro abroad. So I, I really only think it's going to continue to grow as the years go on. Real quick though, what, what has gotten more D3 guys playing pro? Is it the D3 talents gotten better? Is it the agents working and seeing there could be some value in D3? Or is it this, these designations that foreign countries are doing? Uh, allowing non-D1 players. What, what was the catalyst to get this moving more forward for D3 players playing pro? Yeah, yeah, I think, I think it is, you know, it's a couple factors maybe moving all in unison. It's, it's the quality of, of play is definitely increasing. I think the, the, the awareness is, is raising both in the U.S. and then, as you mentioned, kind of with agents abroad. Um, there's a guy that we interviewed. His name's Will Hanley, played at Bowdoin. And, uh, you know, had this incredible professional career, played in Japan, played in Uruguay, played in Spain, all over the world, and started out in, I think it was like the third division of Spain. And this agent had given him a chance and, you know, helps his team out and they do really well in his first season. But I think it was because the third division finished a little earlier than the second division. His agent said, hey, you know, this team's trying to make the playoffs, so they're trying to make a late season push. Do you want to play for their team? And he said, sure. So he gets on the second division team and does really well. And then the season comes to an end, and all of a sudden a first division team signs him because they've seen how he's done in the other two leagues. Um, and, you know, I've, I've, I've looked back now at that agency, and they've continued to sign division three players since then. Mm. Um, so, you know, it's just a, it's just a process of getting to – getting to know that the opportunities are out there for talented D3 players in these states, and then also a recognition from foreign teams and agents to be looking for that kind of, uh, that kind of talent pool in the future. Yeah, that's a great story there on how that works. That's only going to cascade more and more and help more kids down the line from the D3 level. Exactly. And then now with COVID going on, I mean, the theory uh, a lot of coaches have been telling me is since there's less spots at D1, you know, D1 players are now going to trickle down to D2 that normally wouldn't play D2. D2 players that normally wouldn't play D3 and D1 are now going to trickle down to D3. Um, so the game in, in general is going to lose about 500 players at the D1 level that probably shouldn't have been there in the first place. And just this kind of shift with COVID could potentially make the college game better at all levels. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and it's something I was talking to a D3 head coach the other day, top 25 program, and he was saying that, you know, they normally recruit at those D1 camps anyways, as a, mm -hmm. as a, uh, as a habit every single year. They're at, they're at the Lafayette camps, they're at the Ivies, they're at, you know, Colgate and all around the Northeast trying to find those guys who just like you're talking about are, are on the cusp of D1 versus trying to play at another level. And I think more so than any year he could remember, he was saying those guys that are on the fringe are going to have to go D3, which is mm -hmm. great for the division three level. Um, Cause it really is going to bring in some high level talent. And I, you know, I don't think it's any, it's not a knock on those guys to say, you know, you're going D3 versus D1. I think really they will be a massive impact player from an early stage in their career at division three, where maybe they would have ridden the bench and, chipped in three or four points, you know, in the early stages of their, their Ivy or, or a Patriot league career. So it's that age old debate, isn't it, Carl, you know, it you is some place and play, or do you go someplace at the bench because it's D one. Yes. And everyone's got to make their own decision on that. It's true. You know, and, and I am extremely biased. I think that the title of our, uh, of, of, of D three direction kind of give us away a little bit, but you know, I just, I can't help but push for people to try to find an opportunity where they can really, you know, enjoy their basketball experience, but also have a great academic experience. And when you, you know, I, personally, I think it's a lot more fun to get into a situation where you're still playing at a high level and you can still contribute and play a lot of time instead of, uh, you know, being a preferred walk on or, just kind of being a practice dummy for four years because personally that doesn't sound, you know, there's, there's a, there's a role in that there's a value in it, but it personally doesn't sound like it would be the most enjoyable. Yeah. And that's the route I took. So I, I was the guy that went to a post-grad year and then went to a D one program just for that chance to play. And 
you know, I went to an engineering school, which I'm an, I'm a, my mom's an English teacher. Uh, it was the Air Force Academy, so I had to give five years in the military. So should I, in hindsight, have gone to a, a you know, a D3 school where at six, seven, I'd have been one of the tallest guys in the conference, gotten an education in something I wanted to actually study versus engineering. It's all hindsight. You'll ne I'll never know. But when I talk to families all the time about what the kids' goals are, about 95%, Carl, say D1. And I say, ah, cool. Well, let me tell you my experience. And you tell me if, if, if that sounds appealing to you, because that's what I went through to reach my D1 dream, which, you know, was not maybe the best experience. So yeah. I think it's valuable that guys like you are, are putting all this information out there. And there's other guys that like William Payne, uh, Chadwick Hickson, that, that also dropped great information. And I've learned a lot, even though I've been in this game my whole life, I've learned a lot from you about the D3 world. Um, and now, since every kid wants to go pro, if, if there are more and more kids going pro from D3, that's only going to help the marketing. Yep. Now, speaking of pros, Duncan Robinson is the one that I know as probably the biggest success story of D3 to you know NBA. Are there any others out there that uh, are on your short list? Yeah, I mean, right now, there's a guy named Freddie Gillespie who, similar to Duncan Robinson, went from uh, a small D3 in Minnesota to the Division One level, played at Baylor for a little bit, and then just signed a, a contract with the Raptors. Um, there's another guy, Eric Demers, who was on that We Are D3 TBT team, who uh, just had a, he had a tryout with the, with the Spurs Summer League team and was playing with them for a little bit. Another guy, Ty Saban, who is currently playing over in Italy right now, but um, has tried out with the Bucks and with the Cavs in the past. And, um, you know, I'd have to go look. I feel like I've been more focused on Europe right now and, and other avenues. The NBA is definitely, it's, you know, it's what's sexy. It's what gets eyeballs. And, um, you know, I think it is, it is a large part of why, why that D one or bus mentality is out there. Like you're describing with over 90% of families. But I think what, what one of my goals is aside from just generally promoting the division three level is to try to broaden that definition of what pro is and um, help, help families to understand that if that is a goal, it's attainable in another place outside of the NBA. There you go. You just do your job at that level. They'll find you. Simple exactly. Enough. All right. Next myth. D3 teams cannot beat D1 teams. And I'll just speak personally on that. My alma mater, Air Force, uh, I don't know, eight years ago, got beat by Colorado College. And that's what led to the coach getting fired because you just can't let that happen. So tell me some more instances where a D3 school has uh, had an upset. Yeah. Uh, you know, this season, I should have checked my notes before this, but um, the, the past season, Greensboro College pulled it off. Um, you know, it, it, yeah, I'd have to go back and look, I def, I have a list that I keep, mm -hmm. um, but it is one of those things where, you know, in my personal experience, we played Columbia my freshman year and got absolutely stomped. Um, they were really good and we could tell why they were a division one program. Uh, but I do think at times, you know, division three teams do get brought in early in the season as kind of a cakewalk matchup for you to work some things out and they end up playing you a lot tighter than you expect. Um, I know Emory is, is kind of a tough schedule for division one opponents at this point, because they've done it and scared a couple teams with some pretty close games. Uh, Jason Zimmerman's crew down there in Atlanta. Um, but yeah, I think, I just think that as the, recruiting margin between division three and division one players continues to blur a little bit mm -hmm. on the margins. Uh, those games are going to continue to get tighter. And also I think, I think there are some tremendous coaches at the D three level as well, who, you know, there's a lot of talk about you know, people wanting to go up and people, you know, trying to make a name for themselves at D three so they can then establish themselves at D one and, and continue to, to grow and grow. But I think, you know, more and more, there are a lot of coaches who are saying, you know what D3 is like is a pretty good landing spot for me. You know, you're in a good town, you found a great academic school that you can really recruit hard to and um and build something at. And I know some a lot of former D1 assistants who are now really enjoying the head coaching 
lifestyle at Division Three because it's a lot less of a grind. Um, the recruiting is still intense, but you just don't have to be out on the road constantly. Um, and there's just there, it's ratcheted down a little bit in terms of pressure. So, um, yeah, all that to say, I think you'll see a lot better, higher quality of coaching than what's expected um, and generally thought of at the D3 level. And I think the recruiting margins will will make those games uh, continue to make them competitive in the future. Yeah, I'm trying to get my D3 coaching buddies. I think every single one of them was a D1 assistant. You know, Josh Merkel, yep. Abe up at McAllister, Damien at Colby, Landry at Swarthmore, um, Brian Lane at Transylvania. I, I, all those guys have spent <clears throat> time at that level, and you see them now building their empires at their current schools, which, exactly. by the way, Transylvania, that's from my hometown of Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, that was a school that was NAI back in the day and, you know, I always had a standing offer to go there if anything happened at Air Force. But they now play Kentucky every year or every other year at Rupp Arena, and they walk to Rupp Arena from their campus. And that's part of their uh, <laughs> their shtick. But last year with COVID, uh, Transylvania, it, they played all these OVC teams. They played Kentucky, Louisville, just because they were so nimble and just hopped on a bus and went everywhere. And they played games on ESPN last year. So a team that people make fun of probably because the name of Transylvania, uh, but they got some good marketing last year because of COVID. So that was good being nimble. Uh, the other myth, D1 walk-ons versus D3 student athletes. We kind of discussed that already. Uh, how about this myth? D3 student athletes are not athletic. Yeah, I, I think this goes back to just what we've discussed as, uh, with recruiting, you know, and, and a general lack of knowledge about the, the level of play. Uh, that it's a lot of like six foot white guys who are just shooting threes. And um, that's pretty much it. I, you know, there's a reason that some of these recruits are getting pulled up to D one or, you know, are, are going to play pro and it's because they're really athletic and they're talented. And uh, a lot of times, you know, you do get some late growers. So a guy will come in at six, five, but he's skinny and he'll, he'll sprout up to like six, nine during college. And, everyone's kind of like, well, why didn't he go play D1? It's like, well, because when he was out of, when he was out of high school, he was uh, you know, a little bit of a project, but um, I, I do love putting that one up on Twitter because coaches always will submit these great clips of just people throwing down or, you know, a tip slam or, or something that, that really puts the levels athleticism on display. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's great. More and more now with social media, you're going to be able to see that and see that proof. Uh, the bonus myth, yep. yeah, D3 sports don't have fans. Yeah, I think this one is, it's tough. It does vary from school to school. There were times, I remember early in my career when athletics, there, there wasn't like a great balance between the athletic part of the community and the, the non-athletic students um, or non, I guess, students that weren't on an athletic team. And there were days where you know, I'd be in a class and someone was like, oh, we have a basketball team, you know, or, or there just wasn't a recognition um, from other students. But I, as we got a little better, as I think our relationship with the general student body got better, we started to get a lot of fans. Um, and now you know, Swarthmore packs the place out and has a great environment in there for basketball, among other sports. But, you know, that is really not the case of a lot of Division three schools where They've always had fans. And, you know, I love looking at some of these football schools like uh, Mary Harden Baylor, which is just, I mean, it would rival any division one school you can put out there outside of like, you know, the Michigans and the uh, Ohio States, um, their place is rocking. They have a great stadium and they're always bringing in tons of fans. Um, and then you look at a bunch of basketball schools in the Midwest, like, um, you know, Hope College's gym is a world-class facility and you know, that's another one that if you just say what does a d3 facility look like on twitter mm. i think you get these great uh pictures and responses you know colby i think just put in their their administration's really prioritizing athletics and they just put in this beautiful new training facility with weight rooms and uh you know i think the goal was that every team could work out at the same time or something like that uh, so yeah, really good stuff. And again, the level, the mindset at this level is changing. And I think as it does, more and more people will, will clue in both in campus 
on, on the campus community and, and in the surrounding towns. Um, and yeah, you only continue to see more fans at these games. Yeah. And where's hope located? Hope is in Michigan. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Check out their, their, uh, their gym. I think it's called DeVos arena. Okay. Uh, let's get into the part of the conversation I'm, I'm most fascinated to learn about. And I think is going to be most beneficial to people out there listening and that is the financial aspect of d3 sure. so obviously a majority of folks that reach out to me are looking at d2 and d1 for the scholarship right and d3 the biggest question i get and you get are do d3s offer scholarships so first mm -hmm. let's just start with that as our first question and once you answer that for us carl so the answer is yes they do offer scholarships but it is not tied to your athletics as it is at the division one program so you will not have a, you know, if you're playing basketball, which is um, one of the six division one sports men's basketball, where you can get a full ride scholarship. Um, you will not get that at the division three level, but schools have very clear breakdowns based on academics and test scores um, from high school about the merit aid that you'll be able to get. Um, and that all stacks on top of, things like FAFSA aid that you're getting from the government, um, you know, any kind of state aid, any kind of um, just need-based aid that the school can provide. So there are all of these avenues um, at the division three level for financial aid. You just don't have a, it all wrapped up in a, in a pretty you know, package that you can sign on Instagram live and uh, announce to all your followers where you're going. So again, slightly less, uh, less sexy, less eyeballs, but, but at the end of the day, if you're going to college for free, you're going to college for free. Okay. Then we're going to dig into this more uh, that merit money. Do basketball teams or athletic teams have merit money they can give out? Even if it's not a full, can they like, do they have a pot of money they can kind of divvy up on, on their players if they want to? I don't, I don't think it's that explicit. Uh, <clears throat> like, yeah, I don't think a coach can go to the admissions department and say, you know, that coaches definitely have a role to play in terms of advocating for recruits that they want to admit. And there are sliding scales that works differently at each school, but there are sliding scales where they can put more emphasis on a certain player. If they're, if the admissions department judges them to be, you know, in, in an admissible range, but maybe a low admit or something. So mm -hmm. they can, they can provide more emphasis, but there's definitely not like a, a basketball slush fund for merit aid where they can push that money to players. Um, you know, there are, but, but at the same time, tons of athletes who are playing in the division three level are talented students as well. And, you know, I talk about my own experience at Swarthmore. I had a lot of friends who were, you know, had gotten these full ride academic scholarships or leadership scholarships or these things that were out there and the school was offering tons of money for, it was just a matter of, were you aware of it in the first place, which is again, a role that we're trying to fill now is to say, you know, here are the avenues. Yes. You might have to work a little harder to find it than just stumbling into a division one athletic scholarship, but these schools, especially some of the more, uh, the ones with the larger endowments are really focusing on, um, you know, giving out more money in the admissions process. You look at Washington university in St. Louis, whose endowment went up 65% year over year, uh, they just are transitioning now to a need, need blind uh, mm. admissions process. So putting the money to work and um, yeah, I think trying to help a lot more kids go to school for, for less. Help me on this. Uh, a school, why would a school give a full ride for great grades? What does a school get in return? Yeah, I think the school gets a committed student and someone who is, you know, has proven from their behavior in high school that they care about academics, that they're, they're curious, they're, they're passionate. And when they get on campus and get into an environment where, you know, these schools really pride themselves on having great professors and great uh, facilities for students to learn in, that they'll flourish and they'll become, you know, something that the school in a way can brag about and go on to do great things in the world. And, come back and be committed alumni, right? It's a, it's a cycle and it's, it's mutually beneficial for, for schools to, 
to bring in great talent because it reflects really well on them. Because, you know, if someone's already starting at 75 and their goal is to get to a hundred, it's, um, you know, it's a lot easier for the, for the school to, to nurture them and to get them there than if they're starting at 50 or, you know, even lower. And so I think in the way we look at it as a society is that grades are one of the best indications of getting there. So. Yeah. But what the question I've got on that, Carl, is that a lot, let's say the top 10 academic D3 schools out there, right. Mm -hmm. They all have minimum standards, which are very high. Yes. So it seems to me every kid they would let in would qualify for academic aid. Right. Well, and so that's the thing at, at division three schools, every, there's no set standard for, um, eligibility. So I, I remember in high school had a lot of teammates getting recruited to division one and the coaches would always say, you know, remember these, are, these are the standards you got to hit to be eligible, mm -hmm. right? It's the same across all of division one, you got to get cleared at division three, as you note, because there is a variation in terms of academic level, um, you have to look at what each school says, right? Because a school, you know, I, I looked at a couple examples, um, Huntington College in Alabama, right? Versus Loris College. And just what, what I always say is a good starting point is just go on and Google the school you're interested in with the word scholarship behind it. Mm. And that'll give you a pretty clear first guess at where those standards are. And to your point, at some of the higher academic institutions in the country, those standards are going to be a little higher. Um, so yeah, that's another area where balance kind of comes in. It's like, what do you, what do you want? You're going to go into one of these places that maybe you could get admitted, but also maybe you consider another option where the standards on academics are slightly lower. And because you're that top tier student and an athlete, they're going to give you the money. Gotcha. That makes sense now. So if you, the, okay. So to recap here, if I'm understanding this correctly, if I've got great grades, I'm going to be one of many at a top tier school. But if I look at maybe a mid to lower tier academic school, um, they might be more enamored to have me on campus. So I might get more aid from that school. That's correct. Yeah. There's, okay. there's a guy who I really enjoy following and reading his stuff. His name's Jeff Salingo. He was, um, he's an author and he wrote this book called who gets in and why. And he followed, he, he, he sat in with admissions departments at the University of Washington. So massive public school institution. Um, he sat in with Davidson College, which is a small liberal arts school, division one athletics. And then he sat in with Emory, which is a large research institution in Atlanta, but, but has division three sports. And he has this great concept called buyers and sellers. And so the, the, the top 10, you know, as you're describing it, D3 schools, ones who have this great academic reputation, large endowments are the, are the sellers, right? They are pushing, they're able to say, you know, we have this great product. Here, here it is. We're selling this pitch to you and people are attracted to that. Whereas you have the, the buyers who are trying to give students financial aid to level up their academic mm -hmm. profile right and he gives these he gives these great comparisons blind comparisons to say school a and school b you know here's where they are here are their academic profiles here's the standard aid package and then he takes off the nameplate and you know our our brains our ratings focused uh brains are all like okay well that's the better school so that's where i'd want to go and he tries to just break down this kind of confusing world of financial aid, but also show that, you know, you can get a great education and go to school for a lot less if you're willing to, to go to maybe look at one of those buyers instead of uh, all sellers. What you're discussing sounds like um, March Madness Sunday when they show two teams in the bubble and they show their, their resume. Exactly, so the resume. Me. Yeah, it's the same difference. And did you read the book, The Gatekeepers? I did not, but that's on my list. Put that on your list because that's where a guy sits in at Wesleyan to do the same thing Jeff did uh, and just kind of be a mirror through the whole process. He actually visited some kids they were talking to. And the thesis sentence from that, that I tell all my prep school candidates and anyone out there that wants to, to pay attention, but it's be an interesting kid, mm -hmm. right? And the example I use, Carl, are clones. Like, let's say you've got the exact same player, right? Let's say we have two Carl Barkleys right here 
you guys are exact same stats, grades, and everything. But this Carl Barkley is also the student body vice president. And, you know, if you had both side by side, you'd take the guy that has the student body president, vice president next to his name. Just like players, you know, everything's the same, but this Carl Barkley takes charges. Well, that's going to separate you and make you more interesting than the Carl Barkley that does not take charges. So it's yeah. not all about stuff in your resume, like a lot of families think. It's about uh, narrowing in on two to three extracurricular activities to go on top of your sport where you might have a leadership position or you help build it versus having just a bunch of random stuff. Because I don't know about you, but I was in the Latin club and the Spanish club. I didn't do jack in those. I only was in there to put it on my, my school resume, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's very interesting. All right. Um, any more to add on that? Uh, yeah, I would just say kind of in closing, you know, I think at a lot of these schools, to your point, they, they want you to come in if you are in those final stages of, of getting admitted. They want you to come in for an interview. And, you know, I, you say be an interesting kid. I think have something that if someone really dug in in an interview and said, you know, Corey, why are you doing Latin club, right? You'd be on the spot and you'd say, well, I just because my friends are doing it or, yep. you know, there, there's not really a, a story behind it or, or why you're interested in doing it. Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with, with that thing that you're really investing a lot of time into being your sport. You know, if you're two year captain of your high school, I think that speaks volumes about your leadership capability and your responsibility as a, as a person, but dive in and, and just expand yourself beyond your sport, right? Whether it's trying to start a club or working with a professor on a project or just a community service outing, prove to them and honestly prove to yourself as an as a 17 and 18 year old that you're that you're capable of doing things that are beyond your sport. I think that's really valuable. I'm gonna I'm gonna pipe in with a quick story here, Carl. Uh yep. We got a buddy who is an executive at an oil company in Oklahoma City, and he went to West Virginia University. That's where my dad went and played. So we knew him through the alumni network. And he got a resume that came across his desk. And he was real high up in a skyscraper, real near the top of the food chain. And he gets all these resumes. But the, at the bottom of this one resume was this young guy in his early 20s that said, I ate the 72-ounce steak at the Big Texan Steakhouse in Amarillo, Texas. And that's a challenge where if you eat the steak with the shrimp cocktail, the salad, the uh. baked potato within an hour – you get it for free, you get a t-shirt and your name on the wall. And if you don't, yep. it, it probably costs you $130, right? So the guy, the CEO is like, I, I want to see this kid's stat in my office. So they spend five minutes chatting about his resume and then they cut the crap and says, all right, you got to tell me about, you know, eating the 72 ounce steak. And the kid explained, yeah, me and my buddies were on spring break in college. We were drinking all week at you know, South Padre Island. And on our way back to Oklahoma, we stopped there and our stomachs were so expanded from all the beer we drank. I just housed it. And based on that interesting story, he got hired in the spot. So I'm not saying kids need to go out and, and do the, the big Texan challenge in Amarillo, Texas. Right. But I, I mean, that to me is way more interesting than any other thing on that guy's resume. So if you can find something interesting or quirky, that's a conversation piece that someone can like, at a school can say, Hey, we got a kid here that blah, 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 blah. And he also, you know, created his own robot or something like this. That's part of what we're talking about being an interesting kid. So yeah, exactly. There are Southwest flights to Amarillo. If anyone wants to put that on their resume, because <laughs> I, I think it's a great conversation. Hell I've actually watched YouTube videos of people eating that. And I'm just like, could I do that? You know, no, I don't think I could. Well, it's, it's one of those <laughs> silly challenges I've thought about. Yeah. It takes me a couple of days. We need to go to South Padre Island, I think, for a week and then prep. Uh, we'll film a live podcast on there. There we go. We'll have the D3 Prep Athletics Conference live from the Big Texan. And there, uh, there we go. Okay, uh, back to financial aid, because I still want to dig into some more. FAFSA. Yes. Explain what FAFSA is. So FAFSA is um, just the standard government form that anyone can fill out that helps to determine a baseline and some people could argue whether it's fair or not, but determine a baseline for your need um, that you can send to all colleges. And it's kind of like the common app for financial aid in a way. Okay. And then you mentioned that just shows the school what your family can afford to pay, right? Yes, that's correct. And then the school will determine if they want to give you that need-based aid or not. Yeah. It's not a guarantee. 
Well, and it depends. It depends, right? So some schools are are need blind, so they will do the entire admissions process without considering financial aid as a factor, mm-hmm. and then and then try to meet all of demonstrated need. Again, these, these the terms vary at different schools, and it gets a little complicated. But um, you know, there are some schools shifting to that model. There are also a lot though that are still considering financial aid as a as a part of the entire admissions package and um, another thing that Jeff Salingo talks about in his book is just what is the you know the percentage of full payers versus the percentage of people on on aid and trying to strike a balance because you know ultimately colleges have to keep the lights on and right. they're they are a business um, so it's um, yeah, it's a it's a mix. All that to say. Yeah, and then you mentioned two state could offer money. So is there a pool that each state has that goes towards financial aid at colleges? So there, you know, I think it depends. Some states have some states have a little better programs. Like I, I think New York is one of the best. They have the CUNY and and SUNY state uh, institutions or City University in New York that offer you know a lot of in-state aid to New York City, New York City residents or New York State residents who are trying to go to college. And that's in um, their pot that that's approved every year through the budget that schools can draw from. I believe so. But and it's not I, I, I don't know if it's necessarily the school is able to give that. It's just that they're able to offer a way lower admission price to, to individual students. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure how the mechanics of that actually work out, but then, you know, you have other states like Georgia has this hope scholarship, which is, you know, a great boon for anyone from the state of Georgia trying to go to school in Georgia. And a lot of these are programs that try to prevent talented students from leaving the state. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's something that we always try to advise and, and to push out there is just look before you, it's, it's all well and good to look nationwide. I think it's, it can be beneficial to spread your wings, leave home and, and be your own person. But before you do, just make sure that you understand what being a Georgia resident or being a New York resident um, can, can do for you in terms of a cost of college impacts um, if you decide to go to a school in that state. Yeah, and I think Pittsburgh University had, if anyone gets above a 3.2 or a 3.5, they can go there for free. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and there's one school, maybe you know what it is, Carl, but if you've got, a, if you're a Val Victoria in your class, I think either within the state or anywhere in the country, you go there for free too. Have yeah. you heard that? I don't remember which one that okay. is, but yeah, I think programs more and more like that are popping up. There's one we were, I was looking at the other day when I was doing research for a thread and um, there was a school that would give money to people who were from Ohio, right? Like they're uh, trying to yes. get more kids in their admissions class from Ohio which again is part of this formula. Yeah. Admissions is not really like an exact science. They, the departments are trying to have a balance of states. They're trying to have a balance of, you know, between the genders. They're trying to have a balance of need uh, people on, on aid versus full payers. They're trying to have, you know, racial equity. They're trying to, there's just, they, they want to create a story with their admissions class. And if you're from North Dakota, right? And you have good grades, Yes, a lot of schools will give you money because you fit a need of theirs. And that's same for prep schools. They want culture. They want diversity. It's, it's pretty much the same thing. And that's why I compare prep school admission processes to the D3 world because sometimes mm-hmm. it works like that, especially at the yep. need-based schools. Lastly, I want to go back to merit again. So athletics don't have merit to give to their potential student athletes, but the schools give merit out for other things, such as being from a uh, emerging market or, or being a race not represented. So uh, how, how do they, first of all, how do they determine the size of the merit pool and who gets to pull from that merit? Is that strictly academics or is that fall in a different pot than maybe being an interesting kid? Because mm-hmm. let me ask you this, does being an interesting kid and maybe having like your own robotics lab you started, does that help and does that get you merit or does it have to be kind of fall within the confines of the school that yeah, you came from? That- It could depend on the school again, which is why it pays to do your research and look at where these, like say you're going to um, Caltech, right? 
who really prioritize robotics, maybe they have a special program where they're trying to pull in the best and the brightest robotic students in the country. Sure, they might have money, but then you look at another school who doesn't have a robotics program, they're probably not going to do it. But at the same time, there are a bunch of D3 schools that partner um, with organizations who will give you money if you commit to being, you know, a community service fellow, or you've, you've shown through your high school career that you have a passion for community service and um, apply as, I think it's a Boren fellow. I gotta, I gotta look at the, the exact name. Um, but, you know, it's a full ride to some of these great institutions. Mm. And yeah, the Boren Awards, uh, that's for language. Ah, I'll find it. We'll, we'll, we'll put it in the show notes, but um, yeah, all that to say, be an interesting kid. And, and there are a lot more ways than just academics to, to access some of that financial aid money. And if I'm a player that wants to go the D3 route and see my financial options, what, where should a kid start? I mean, there are, how many D3 uh, basketball schools are there in the country? Uh, over 400. So where do I start? 420. I, yeah. I think, I think again, you have to make, if you're a high school recruit, you have to make your list of schools. You have to think about what is a good fit for you in terms of academics. What is a place that you actually want to be for school, right? You could get, you could get a full ride and be, I mean, it'd be, it'd be a tough decision to make, but be in a place that you really don't want to be for four years. And the question would be, is it worth it? Right. You know, if you hate the location, say you're in in New Mexico and your family lives in Maine and they can't ever get out to see your games. Um, right. you know, is that a priority for you? I think think about all those things, make a list and then go through and research the financial aid opportunities at each school, 10 to 12 schools. Is Once there a you... data? No, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, yeah, go ahead. No, is there a database out there of like the 400 D one programs and I can start clicking like East coast, uh, price academic ranking, uh, less than a thousand students. Is there a database to kind of help potential students narrow down these fields? If they know if there's schools out there, they might be good fits for, but have no idea exist. Yeah. I don't think there's necessarily one place. I think because things change so much, you know, even in trying to trying to pull up to date financial aid information recently, I've found sites that, you know, will list, a 2018 scholarship or something. And so, oh, so schools maybe aren't the best at updating or, um, yeah, I just, I think given, given how many things are, how many variables are in play there, it's just something that no one's really done. So are you a resource? Is that what your plan is Carl to become a resource for potential student athletes? Yeah, I think so. I think that's, that's part of the mission is just like that we're, we're here to help and that uh, people can, DM us with questions, which we get a lot. And, um, but uh, most of the time it's people starting out from zero and saying, you know, mm -hmm. where do I, where do I start and what, what should I look for and where, where should I be going to camps and these types of questions. So yeah, we're, we're going to have a website up pretty soon and, and, um, looking to have some blog posts that will hopefully answer some of the FAQs that a lot of families are having, um, in their own recruiting processes. So perfect. Yep. And you played at Swarthmore, uh, what do you wish you would have known? Like say D3 direct would have existed as you're a high school senior. Sure. Um, would you have still ended up at Swarthmore? And that's a hypothetical. It's an if question, but I'm just curious. And what information would you have liked to have known going in that you didn't know at the time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I got really lucky. I think because, you know, I, I walked into a coaching situation where guy was kind of on his way out and, ended up only being there for a year before Landry Kozmalski, who's been tremendous at SWAT and has led them to, you know, a national championship game and a number one overall ranking in the country came in for my last three years and, and did great things with the program. But um, yeah, I think, I think if i had had a, that resource and someone I could have picked their brain, I would have just probably done a little more digging on, on the coach and, um, but, but I feel like overall, I, I benefited from a process that was research heavy and really thought about, you know, the ins and outs of would I like to go to school here before I thought about the basketball program. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And, and I think that served me well that, that I was able to make a lot of character-based decisions after, you know, knowing, feeling confident that I did like the school, then make character evaluations to the guys on the team and the coaches and things like that. And it wasn't without bumps in the road. I, I had, you know, trips booked and then coaches would call me and say, Hey, you know, we filled, filled the spot. So we're not really recruiting anymore. And it's like, well, okay, I have a hotel and a flight booked. So I guess I'm going to go somewhere else or like that, that the Swarthmore trip, it ended up kind of being fortuitous. That was one, um, it was supposed to be a one night stay. And then there was going to be a one night stay at another school. That school bailed on me a week before I turned Swarthmore into a two night visit and it ended up being for the best. So mm -hmm. oh, yeah, pretty cool. happy with how my process worked out and just trying to help others feel like they had the confidence that I felt like I did um, after a lot of work and just hopefully help lower that bar so that not everyone has to start from where right. I did. Yep. Yeah. It's a, it's a valuable resource you're providing there. Um, let's finish on some quick hitters here. Sure. What's the biggest win of your basketball playing career? Um, college or high school? College or high school. <laughs> I mean, I think high school, we, we beat the number one team in the state. We were their only loss. It was uh, West Charlotte who had guys that multiple division one players, Kennedy Meeks went to play at Carolina. Um, they had a guy who went to Mississippi state. I think they might have a guy to go to Florida that year or something. I mean, they were, they were stacked and, and I had a game winner to, to beat them no at the buzzer. So oh. that, was, that was probably the most memorable. That's awesome. Yeah. I've not been that lucky, but uh, I can live it through guys like you. How about the best player you ever played against? Oof. There was a guy named JT Terrell who played for, for West Charlotte in an earlier year who definitely it was clear at that point to me in my high school career that there was a difference between division one players mm -hmm. and and not um because he was unguardable felt like from anywhere on the court from anywhere over half court he was a problem and uh really great jumper ended up playing at wake forest so yeah just kids that reaching out to me they always want scholarships always want to play in the nba and i've got a kid right now from overseas a big man and he first email i'm gonna play in the nba it's like all right cool yeah me too and uh this year his first game is going to be against brewster academy so i'm That's just gonna, gonna wake up yeah, and at worst jason's gonna have a at worst a mid-major big right yeah so i'm just gonna watch this kid and just be like hey man you take care of this kid you're on your way but like if you can't handle this kid uh, we're gonna have a long way to go to get to the NBA. So exactly. it, it's a great proving ground to where you found that out garden JT and a lot of these kids in the prep school world are going to find that out once the season starts. And that's what kids need these days is oh, context, yeah. right? I could do, we could do a whole podcast on, on just the need for context and people having unrealistic expectations about themselves because they've never actually played against a challenge or been in a, in an adverse situation with a coach who was tough on them or, you know, um, Anyways, don't want to derail the quick hitters here. Well, but the, the flip side on that is the kid that outperforms a kid at an event and that kid signs somewhere, then they use that on their resume too. Like, well, my son outperformed this kid going to Clemson. Uh, so therefore my son's as good as Clemson. Yeah, which is very silly. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, maybe he is better, but you know, that guy had the right performance at the right time in front of the right people. So um, yeah. anyway, what are your hobbies when you're not doing D3 Direct? Hobbies? Uh, big reader um yeah lately you know it's been it's been a lot of like i'll go on i love to go on walks in the morning and listen to an audiobook pop that in um gotten into doing a lot more more yoga and trying to take care of my body i think that would be something you know you said what, what do you wish you would have known now looking back on college i think recruiting basketball side it just would have been taking how to take care of my body um and so you, you, we, as basketball players, we beat, we beat ourselves up pretty heavy, uh, a lot of running, a lot of impact on the knees. And I think learning how to stretch properly and, and take care of my body recently has been a hobby. So. Oh, cool. What, what books you, any you can recommend that you're reading or recently read? Uh, yeah. A couple good ones. Um, there's a great, um, it's a sci-fi series by a Chinese author called the three body problem, which I think was, 
is a is a really interesting book if you're into into sci-fi but also if you're into you know current events and politics and so it's written all from a chinese perspective and chinese main characters and um you know the west and the united states are kind of seen as the as the the foil in the story and there's this great need for cooperation and kind of some um all, all wrapped in in the lens of like through through chinese history and um and then the, the author does a great job of like projecting out um, trying to imagine what human society will be like in the next couple hundred years. So I think really interesting series and uh, that's worth a read. All right, nice. Uh, last one, what's your favorite movie? <sighs> favorite movie? Um, or, top, or top two or three. Yeah, awesome. yeah. There's, there's a good one recently that I watched called the, uh, um, my French is terrible if non-existent, but it's called uh, Lay, in, Lay in Touch Up lay in touch a bull or um it's about this guy who becomes a caretaker for a, a wealthy man who's in a wheelchair and uh i think it's just an awesome movie so yeah, they remade that with brian cranston and kevin hart i have not seen that one but the original one i saw that too and that was pretty good yeah i i just that's one that sticks out uh, of note of late so okay perfect well if people want to find you carl at where where can they reach you and see yeah, your I good think, stuff i think D3 Direct is the best place on Twitter. That's where I'll be the most active. And um, yeah, DMs are always open. So hit us up if you have questions and we'll be happy to help. Is there anything we did not discuss today that you feel needs to be shared about the D3 world? Yeah. Uh, I think if you're having doubts, go to a D3 game, right? Mm -hmm. If you're not sure about the D3 level, try to find a school in your area and go to a game see what the level is like up close. And I think that's one of the best ways to, like we kind of touched on earlier, is get context and help bring your expectations maybe down to earth or clear them up a little bit about maybe get rid of some of those misconceptions you had about the level. That's an excellent idea. I, I think you should put that on a billboard somewhere. I, I just think kids need to see that so they can be like, oh, right, this is how. Before you write levels. it off. Yeah, before you write it off. All right, well, this was uh, the most recent episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast featuring D3 Direct's Carl Barkley. Uh, Carl, thank you so much for joining today. And um, if you guys want to not miss an episode, be sure to subscribe on all major podcasting platforms and YouTube. YouTube actually have fun little clips on there. Um, pulled from these podcasts that are quick hitters and any questions from me, be sure to go to prepathletics.com. You can find me there or uh, I'm on Twitter most of the time as well. So thanks again, Carl. We appreciate it. And, uh, we'll see you guys next time on the prep athletics podcast. Thanks, Corey.